Heroes, martyrs, victims, and historical figures. All would have a place in the Hall of Heroes if that country still existed with the borders they helped to defend with all the other fighting men. Prime Minister Count Ishvantisa, who, 100 years ago, tendered his resignation on the order of the Austro-Hungarian sovereign and then left for the front to fight. One year later, he was assassinated in his home during the Astor Revolution. Admiral Miklos Horty, in the middle of May in 1917, was victorious at Otranto on the Adriatic Sea. Hermann Kovesh captured Belgrade in 1915 and in 1917 recaptured Bukovina from the Russians. Károly Krotochvil was victorious on the Italian front at Di Shonzo, also 100 years ago. Horty, Kovesh, Krotochvil. All were recipients of the Maria Theresa Military Order of 1917. Ferenc Sombatei, who, with Henrik Bert, not only fought throughout the First World War and the Soviet Republic of Hungary, but also throughout the Second World War, as both were commander-in-chiefs of the Hungarian army. True, more than 20 years after the First World War. Finally, Count Janos Esterházy, politician and martyr, who was charged and sentenced to death under the same legal paragraph as his political opponent, Joseph Tiso, who had served as a military chaplain in the First World War and who was executed in 1947 even though it was he who had created the independent Slovak state. Life histories full of contradictions and important lessons for today. For further contemplation, an Ashpektosh evening of debate was organized with the participation of Russian historian Sergei Nelipovich, the director of the Balishiha Municipal Government's Archival Department in Moscow. Having lost two million soldiers by the fall of 1916, the Russian army proved to be incapable of crushing the military strength of the Central Powers. The Austro-Hungarian and German military divisions, supported by the Ottoman and Bulgarian troops, had successfully resisted and succeeded even in conquering Romania, which had intervened on the side of the Entente. By then, at least for the Russian Empire, the chance for victory seemed as remote as it had been in 1914. Furthermore, the peace proposals drafted by the Germans at the end of 1917, contrary to all the other warring parties, specifically favored Russia, as they did not include any elements which would have questioned the sovereignty of the Russian state. In November of 1916, for the Central Powers, the recognition of Polish independence would have resulted in the borders of Russia being subject to open debate, even in the event of an Entente victory. It it became clear then that the Russian Empire would not be able to maintain Russian Poland within the borders of Russia, neither as a victorious nor as a defeated party. One of the primary reasons for this was the outbreak of the first Russian Revolution in February 1917, which had in fact begun as a military coup. The local guard at the capital stood up along with the dissatisfied, grumbling population of St. Petersburg, protesting against the poor provision of supplies for the capital. Otherwise, the police forces would have easily dispatched with the smoldering unrest rising to the surface. In addition, the top ranks of the army, the commanders on the front, did everything possible to strip the Tsar from power. There was even talk of arresting him. At the same time, however, all the participants of this military coup, including the liberal opposition, thought that they would be successful where the Tsar had not been, that they would succeed in ending the war in victory. The so-called Guchkov cleansing of much of the Russian military leadership was named after Guchkov, the Ministry of War for the Provisional Government. 500 top-ranking Russian officers were served their discharge papers in the spring of 1917. That summer, the Provisional Government ordered the army to begin what later became known as the Kerensky Offensive, which in reality was led by General Brusilov.
Nyáron pedig megindították a később a szovjet történetírásban inkább Kerenszki offenzívaként elhíresült, de valójában Brusilov tábornak vezette hadműveletet. Meghalt az, az idős Ferenc József 16. November, november 21-én, és jött az új uralkodó váltás történt a diplomáciában. The age Franz Joseph passed away on November 21st of 1916, and change came with the new directors of foreign diplomacy and internal relations. The new dual foreign minister, Otto Karczernin, had been a prominent member of the Belvedere Group and represented the ideology of Franz Ferdinand, who was assassinated in Sarajevo. An entirely new foreign policy of peace began to take shape. Chernin tried to persuade the Germans to attempt a separate peace. By this, Germany would relinquish Belgium and reinstate its independence. Alsace-Lorraine, which had been part of German territory since 1870, would be ceded to France. Naturally, German wasn't having any of this, while at the same time the armies were completely exhausted. Later, Italian commander-in-chief Luigi Cardona is replaced, and there was a complete replacement of the leadership of the monarchy as well. The authoritarian commander-in-chief Konrad von Hutzendorf, one of the main proponents of the war, was replaced by a Transylvanian Saxon, General Arthur Arts, who was moderately friendly to the Hungarians and who ended up passing away in Budapest in the 1930s. A totally new policy was also initiated in the army. Konrad, aki egy rendkívül erőszakos, rendkívül dinamikus személyiség, nem lehet vele vitatkozni. Ugye Konrad von Hölzendorf, a vezékkari főnök lényegében a háborúnak a, az egyik elindítója, és ő helyette egy erdélyi száz, egy arc távolszer nagy nevű ember, aki mérsékelten magyar barát, annak ellenére, hogy száz, tulajdonképpen szereti a magyarokat, ugye Budapeste hal meg a 30-as években, és egy egészen más politika veszi kezdetét magában a hadseregben is, illetőleg a, a, a katonai viszonyokban. De 1917 mindenképpen az eredményekről szól, 1917 was the year of achievements and ended up being the most successful year for the Central Powers in the progression of the war. With the Battle of Caporetto, the breakthrough at the Italian front was the most decisive military operation to succeed, albeit with German aid. If we look at the exact figures, the 37 military divisions to execute the breakthrough were opposed by 41 defensive Italian divisions. These divisions employed a new tactic introduced by the Germans, which was that, in lieu of attacking the enemy where they were, on top of the mountains, the plan was to advance from the valley below, then surround the enemy, which would soon surrender, and then retreat quickly from the mountains to the plains ahead and break through. This was the objective. No one counted on what actually followed. Tagliamento and Piazza a hátunk mögött hagyva őket bekerítjük, és utána így is maguktól meg fogják adni magukat, és aztán gyorsan elérni, kiérünk a hegyekből, és akkor pósikságon törünk előre, és gyakorlatilag megsárjuk a talja mentoim, ugye ez volt a kitűzött cél az ő részükről. Azt, hogy a pia veled belőle, ez már gyakorlatilag erre senki nem számított. Brusilov kakrasz bül adnyim is nejbóli aktívnak, Brusilov was one of the proponents of a general advance and overall plan of Russian attack. He had shared this plan already in December of 1916 with the acting Russian commander-in-chief, the Tsar. He then modified his plan in the spring of 1917. He thought to liberate Romania, bring Bulgaria to its knees, completely destroy Austro-Hungary, and force Germany to make a peace all in one blow. This plan was completely out of touch with reality. He didn't take into account the actual balance of power. It seems you don't have a very high opinion of Brusilov, despite the fact that his reputation in the international academic texts on the subject is that both the Wehrmacht and the Red Army employed Brusilov's military strategy of World War I successfully in World War II. Brusilov got his idea for the 1916 offensive from the French military operation in the fall of 1915. 
There was nothing unique about it. The Brusilov plans of both 1916 and 1917 counted on Austria-Hungary being destroyed in these battles. He was mistaken. For one, he underestimated the strength of his enemies, and for another, he had not noticed that the methods of war had changed from 1914. If the enemy retreats, it would be strengthened and entrenched in the attacking positions. This is what the Russian army, prepared to attack in 1917, had to confront as well. Contrary to the year 1916, in 1917 the Central Powers were able to exact a few counterattacks against the advancing Russian forces. Such was the breakthrough of the Russian lines at Tarnopol. The loss of the lives of a half a million Russian soldiers proved to be in vain in the Russian military operation from the Divina River to the Black Sea. Brusilov was unable to attain his goal, and politicians were beginning to use the army for their own political objectives. The army's capability was no longer important, but instead how foreign political objectives were being interpreted by the various political movements. Following the fall of Riga, Prime Minister Kerensky used this defeat to name himself commander-in-chief of the Russian army. From this time forward, the soldiers elected the leading officers of the army and organized revolutionary committees. Эти органы должны были как бы быть Taking into consideration that the confidence of the soldiers and the officers was now shaken, these committees played a certain consolidating role. The revolutionary military committees procured extraordinary powers and soon became the most powerful element in the army. It became apparent that not only would it be impossible to exit the war through military means, but also that the varying positioning of the political movements would be able to decide the balance of the army. The soldiers elected those leaders they could trust and they sided with those who promised peace and land, as the Bolsheviks did that autumn. Duhonin, the new commander-in-chief, tried to keep secret the events of St. Petersburg until it was no longer possible. Duhonin, az új vezérkari főnök ugyan egy hétig próbálta titkolni, hogy mi történt Péterváron. They replaced the dual foreign minister Ishvan Burian. Many say he was the long arm of Ishvan Tisa, which is partly true. Then Tisa himself is replaced, which results in great fluctuation in the line of the Hungarian prime ministers up until Bekele in 1918. The year 1917 brought with it the great changes resulting from the Bolsheviks seizing power in St. Petersburg. It's a completely different matter that a Russian civil war followed the outbreak of the Bolshevik Revolution. Not only did human life lose its value in the wake of the First World War, but the individual himself was lost as well. And the civil war was far more brutal than even the World War, and brought more casualties with it than traditional warfare. How can the Bolshevik coup be interpreted from a military perspective? From a military perspective, one can say that a peaceful exit of the war was won in the fall of 1917. The country was totally embittered by then. The ruling opinion of the Revolutionary Military Committees was the following. We condemn the violent overthrow of power by the Bolsheviks, but we support their leadership, as there was no other leadership in the country. Bukovina is liberated by the Austro-Hungarian troops, clearly with German aid, because in 1917 it would have been impossible otherwise. Interesting, and I often emphasize this, 
that the Germans are present in all the greater military operations, such as those at Gordice, Caporetto, and in the Romanian offensive. Without German aid, experience, discipline, and military technology, the army of the monarchy would often have been in great difficulty. The First World War, which combined both the continuity of the past and the deviation of the present, differed in the aspect of remembrance. As it involved masses of people, the entire thing, and I can't put it any other way, became democratized. Something had to be done with the fact that hundreds of thousands of people were dying, and another several hundred thousand were injured just on the Hungarian side, as all over Europe as well. Millions died and were injured, and many more millions were affected by this. The loss of the head of the family, the loss of a son, these all meant family tragedies, and as such, this became a mass experience, which is why I said the war became democratized as an experience. It was no longer a battle between aristocrats and their noble orders, and the result was the need for the simple soldier to be elevated to a pedestal. Not only the officers, but the soldiers in gray uniform, and by 1917, there were several hundreds of thousands of them dead. This came with the idea that had been formulated in 1915, for the need of some sort of memorial for these men in every community from which a soldier had entered the army and had fallen from enemy fire. This is what was codified in 1917 in Hungary. A fegyver által elpusztított katonáknak állítson emléket, és ez formálódott ki aztán törvényé 1917-ben. The first state leader of an independent Slovakia, its creator, if you like, Joseph Tiso, participated in the First World War as Tiso Jozef. He neither is judged by the public according to his achievements during World War I. Jozef Tiso a galíciai harc teret látta közelebbről, illetve Szlovéniában szolgált. Joseph Tiso had seen the battlefield in Galicia up close, and he had been in military service in Slovenia. He became ill towards the end of 1914, and from the beginning of 1915 he was in Nitra, and that is where the end of the war found him. From that time on, he did not come near the front, nor did he serve any longer in the army, but he had seen the horrors of the war in Galicia, which he reported in perfect Hungarian in a series of articles in the Nitra County Gazette. There had been mass recruitment in Slovak territory as well. Slovak soldiers had been present in the First World War in the Eastern and Balkan war zones, as well as in Italy. The Slovak national remembrance, as well as their historical narrative, see these soldiers as victims. A szlovák nemzeti emlékezet a szlovák történetírás elsősorban mint áldozatokat tartja őket számon. It's rather absurd, isn't it, that Count Janos Esterházy, martyr and politician, who was tried under the same statute as his political opponent, Joseph Tiso, has not been rehabilitated in Slovakia to this day. This is truly a paradox. In Slovakia, Janos Esterházy is seen even today as a war criminal, whereas we Hungarians view him as a hero. My father was a lawyer in Preshov and was the leader of the Hungarian party there, and as such was a close colleague of Esterházy's until his arrest in 1945. He was active on the Czechoslovak, then the Slovak national political scenes, where he represented the interest of the Hungarian minority. Then, following his arrest in 1945, Esterházy was taken to the Soviet Union and tried and sentenced to death in absentia in Czechoslovakia. He had defended the interest of the Hungarians from 1933 to 1945 for 12 years in the Czech and the Slovak parliaments as a member of parliament, as well as the leader of the Hungarian party. Then he suffered for 12 years without trial in prisons in the Soviet Union and in Czechoslovakia. It's incredible, isn't it, that Joseph Tiso and Count Janos Esterházy were taken to court and tried under the same law. Igazságtalan, hiszen Jozef Tiszót valóban 
Joseph Tisa was justly brought to trial as a war criminal. He was responsible for war crimes as he was the leader of the Slovak state in existence from 1919 to 1945. He was the most influential politician, as well as representing the moral standard of the country, as he was a man of the church, a priest. The Slovak people, being a strongly religious people, took his religious doctrine, or at least very seriously, everything that Tiso said. Therefore, he was responsible for all of Slovakia's actions during the Second World War, including participating in the attack of the Soviet Union by Germany, and also for everything which had incurred internally in Slovakia, primarily the deportation of the Jews of Slovakia, which ended in a massacre, as well as the crushing of the Slovak national uprising and the brutalities which followed. Joseph Tiso, with his regime and cabinet, was truly the last satellite of Germany. And, as with the Hungarian Aero Party leadership, he also escaped to Germany. And they stood by the Germans to the very end, almost to capitulation. Conversely, Janos Esterházy cannot be accused of having committed any sort of war crime. There were two charges completely trumped up, and the entire thing was a show trial. The first charge was that as a revisionist Hungarian politician, he made an alliance with the Sudeten Germans who had entered into military service on the part of the Third Reich in 1938. They were allies to Klinka's Slovak Autonomous Party, the Slovak People's Party, and as such, Esterházy was charged as being responsible for the breakup of Czechoslovakia. In addition, they charged him with playing a prominent role in constructing and directing Tiso's regime, which was labeled fascist, whereas Esterházy was in clear opposition to this regime. A harmadik birodalom céljait szolgálták már 1938-ban, szövetkezve a Hlinka féle autonomista szlovák párt, a Hlinka szlovák néppártjával, Csehszlovákia szétverésének az egyik fő felelősévé tették meg őt, tehát Eszterházit, és emellett elítélték azért is, mert úgymond a alapvető szerepet játszott a Tiszó féle fasisztának bélyegzett rendszer kiépítésében és működtetésében, holott Eszterházi ennek a rendszernek az ellenzéke volt, ez nem fér kétség. Think freely about these questions up until the present, as it is not only the goal of our clip competition, but also of life not to repeat past mistakes. We hope to see historically informative clips of two to four minutes, and now we have the experiences of two successful years to build on. Our colleagues and our winning applicants are ready to help. Amiben kollégáink, sőt, sikeres pályázóink is segítséget tudnak nyújtani. The ease of the technology of making films on this subject is very alluring, and we are asking for the help of teachers and the school directors for this project. Szerintem a mai fiatalokat azért alapvetően instruálni is kell, tehát, hogy... I think that today's youth needs instruction. I'm not sure that they always feel what needs to be done. I'm not saying that we need to tell them what they should do, but we need to provide some sort of framework or outline. And if this is done, we will get a better quality of submissions. ...mondani, és ebben az esetben akkor jobb művek születnek. A másik tényleg játékos dolog, és akár egy... The other thing is more of a type of play, such as something started with a weapon or a map found in a museum or passed on to generations within a family or with one of the many class trips. From these examples, the task is really easy. Often the students don't even understand how easy it is. Ebből kiindulva nagyon könnyű a feladat, és sokszor nem is értik, hogy hát hogy, hogy ilyen könnyű. Harminc kettes baka vagyok én, kék parolin mosolyog a blózom tetején. Sokkal kevesebbet bírnak a mai gyerekek, mint akár egy 10-15 évvel. Today's youth can handle less work than even those of 10 to 12 years ago. Textbook information has to be apportioned in ever smaller doses, and the play and entertainment aspect has to be emphasized ever more. Csinálni. 
Én azt vettem észre, hogy videójátékok, a dokumentumfilmek, azok tudnak a legjobban a fiatalokhoz. I noticed that it's information in video games and documentary films which reaches young people, whether or not it is consciously or subconsciously noticed by them. The gunfire game, for instance, on World War I, one notices things which could be important. They could be in documentary films or even commercial films. Tehát ott is az ember észrevesz dolgokat, amik fontosak lehettek dokumentumfilmekben, de akár játékfilmekben is nagyon sok első világháborúval kapcsolatos film van, és ugye ezekkel könnyebb nyitni a diákok felé. I made it in black and white so that it would seem as if it were archival footage. The first World War, which took place between 1914 and 1918, was one of the most significant and most destructive wars in world history. The themes need to be expanded upon. Other than the war, the background of the home country needs to be explored, the life of the simple man or woman. We should be considering the fact that the historical profession is employing a never increasing number of women. Those young women, for instance, who are interested in history, but less interested in the horrors of war, could concentrate on the life of a young female student during the war. This would be a very interesting aspect to the project. And in this way, we could explore the historical perspective of the lifestyle and mentality of the time. Now we have samples to show them, so they shouldn't find the task as daunting. This is what the others have produced. You could do something similar. Agostin's success proved to me that on the one hand, students can be not only participants in learning history, but creators in this process as well. And on the other hand, what possibilities are out there to combine history and information technology, and how the tools for teaching history can be expanded. A personal story, a micro story, can help students in coming closer to history, and this is also an objective of education. Témához, és egyben ez nevelési cél is. The Great War and the Reflection of 100 Years. We are accepting two to four minute short films until December 31st, 2017. E-mail címre, vagy az aspektus Facebook oldalán.